So motion sensitivity warning, um, some of my slides have animations. Uh, I hope to post a version that you can navigate through without animations to wherever you're viewing this video from, uh, but just fair warning. Uh, this talk is called Hot Takes for Fast Sites. My name is Clark Gunn. I'm a senior software engineer, front-end engineer at Formidable Labs. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's Clark underscore Gunn with two N's. Mostly talk about performance, accessibility, and rant about tech stack stuff. A lot of st same stuff I'm talking about in this uh, talk. So this talk is about performance, web performance, and why should you optimize performance? Money. Um, spoiler alert, all these points are going to correlate somehow to money. Uh, personally, I think money is the root of all evil, but likely your employer needs money to pay you money and, or you hope to have an employer to pay you money. Uh, so there's a lot of performance incentives uh, that impact revenue. Uh, SEO is one of them. Google cares how fast your site is. Uh, they're ranking you accordingly. Uh, reputation, how you compare to your competitors. Uh, will your customers go off to a competitor because their app or their site is faster? Uh, something to consider. And availability. Uh, having a faster site means you can reach more people on maybe slower networks with underpowered devices. Uh, maybe in developing countries, having a leaner, faster site makes it easier to access for more people. And we're all impacted. We might, as developers, have the fastest MacBooks, the fastest iOS devices, um, fast Wi-Fis often, but that's not always the case. Sometimes you'll be in a coffee shop, sometimes you'll be on a train going through a tunnel and JavaScript won't load. Uh, we're all impacted by performance and we experience it every day with slow, underperforming websites. So understanding uh, some of these aspects will help you build better, faster sites. WPOStats.com is a website that gives a lot of examples of companies that have uh, seen their bottom line increase because of making performance improvements. Um, lots of examples there. You probably heard the example of Amazon, like some milliseconds equals some millions of dollars of revenue or whatnot. Um, but WPOStats.com is a good place to go to see like the actual figures of companies um, how their increase in performance impacted their bottom line. Should you focus on performance? So I've got a couple bullets here for yes and no. Um, if your site is mostly static content, then really you've got the easy path. There's really no excuse to have an underperforming site. That's if you're same, serving the same content to all of your users, uh, it should be easy to make it fast. If it's revenue impacted, if the site is meant to make a sale or generate a lead, or get the user down the sales funnel in some way, then you should care about performance because uh, people bounce from sites that are underperforming. They'll go to your competitors, they'll find another way to spend their money. So if there's revenue impacted by performance of your site, you should care about optimizing performance. SEO, like I mentioned before, Google cares about how fast your site is, Bing, Alibaba, is that a search engine? I know, but all the search engines are uh, ranking you in some way based on the, your site's performance. And so if you care about where your site, where your company shows up in Google, uh, you should care about performance. Faster sites use less energy, uh, less bytes over the wire, less CPU time on both the server and the client. If you have a faster, leaner site, you are generating less carbon. Your favorite JavaScript library is somehow contributing to the climate crisis. So if that sustainability is something you care about or your customers care about, uh, then you should care about performance. You want to be fast for whatever reason. Maybe that's to be faster than competition. Maybe you're a developer and you want to have a developer portfolio to show to prospective uh, employers. Uh, you want to have a good impression and you want it to be fast. Reasons maybe you shouldn't focus on performance. Interactivity. This is a trade-off with performance. Interactivity requires more JavaScript, which means slower load times. There's you might have to have interactivity. You might need to ship React, to ship Framer Motion, but you have to know that there's a trade-off with performance there. And customers will wait for value. If they've made a purchase for a SaaS product, it's a very highly interactive app, then they'll wait some time for that to load. So there's a trade-off to be considered, um, but the tools that you choose and how you architect your app uh, will have impacts on performance, uh, no matter how interactive it is. So for some apps, being highly interactive is the key point, and you might have to diagnose performance issues down the line. 
other bottlenecks. This is really the key point for maybe not focusing on performance now. If you, or if your app is buggy, if the functionality doesn't work, or you are in a startup and you're running out of runway and you have to like get to market and start making some sales just to stay alive as a business, then maybe that should be your focus uh, until you can stabilize. Um, but then I think you should focus on performance because users care about it. Uh, Performance is kind of a subjective thing. You don't really notice it until it's bad. And then once you've noticed it, like you're in a bad state. So we're, what we're going to cover in this talk is how the browser works, understanding how the browser loads your site, loads the sub resources that you tell it to load, um, impacts performance. So understanding that will be key. Uh, what web vitals are, they're a way to measure how your performance is doing. How to get data. Data is crucial to making performance optimizations. Uh, all the changes you should make should be informed by data. You can do a lot of um, performance optimizations and they have actually no impact to your, how your site performs. If they're not informed by uh, data, then you're probably optimizing for the wrong thing. Make it go fast. Some tips on how to speed up your site and then some hot takes. Uh, this will be mostly my opinions on current tech stacks, uh, frameworks, how they're underserving us performance wise. So how the browser works, we have these three main uh, technologies, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And these are the, these are the code we write, we write and how they're loaded by the browser is uh, important. So this is a mental model that I think you should have, like a base mental model for how the browser works. Uh, by default, all resources are blocking. Uh, there's only a main thread uh, and all the resources compete for it. <clears throat> so when you ship, your app, it's going to come with HTML and HTML is going to have sub resources, CSS, JavaScript images, all that kind of stuff. And how the browser is going to load that is with the HTML parser. And it's going to go line by line down your HTML, finding those sub resources, and then going and fetching those and executing those and then returning to the HTML. So you might think of this like a stack where first you get the HTML, the browser is working on that. Then maybe you're fetching some JavaScript with a script tag. Uh, the browser is then going to go and then it's going to fetch and execute that JavaScript before it returns to the HTML. Then maybe you request a CSS resource. Maybe that has a background image that has to be fetched. Uh, then it'll return the CSS and then finally back to the HTML. So the base default mental model is that everything is blocking. So the browser has a lot of work to do on its own, not just the work that you give it. Uh, you give it the HTML, it's going to have to take that and it's going to parse it into the DOM, the document object model, an in-memory representation of the hierarchy of the structure you've described in your HTML document. It's going to have to create that, and then it creates the CSS DOM, which is a CSS object model version of that, which uh, points to the DOM. Uh, together, these form the layout tree. So that's the DOM and then the style aspect of it, and the output of that goes to layout. Layout uh, determines like the XY coordinates of the elements of your page. The output of that goes to paint. Uh, paint. What does paint do? Uh, paint uses layout and the stacking order, Z index, to like determine like a 3D, um, like a third access to your uh, site. Everything um, from there goes to raster. Raster determines the pixels that go on the page, decoding images, and the output of that goes to the GPU and then finally to the monitor. Each of these phases of the render cycle has its own invalidation function. And each of these functions require a different amount of work for the browser to do. So if you've ever animated, uh, say, doing some CSS animations for background colors, that requires a certain amount of work. But doing a CSS animation for layout, where you're moving things around, is a different amount of work. And you might find that the background color animation works better, like it uh, has less uh, CPU resources needed to calculate than the layout. That's because the, um, these different invalidation functions require a different amount of work. And how we uh, tell the browser to do some recalculations in our CSS and JavaScript will determine how much work the browser needs to do in that render cycle. So the render cycle is 1 60th of a second. The browser renders 60 hertz, 60 times a second, and has to do all of the work it has to do, plus the work that you're giving it on the main thread within 1 60th of a second. So if you've heard of jank, this is when you miss that render cycle. For whatever reason, there was too much work, and the, the browser couldn't render a frame within 1 60th of a second. So if you've had like scrolling stutters or animation stutters, it's an uncomfortable experience. Um, this is what jank is. 
So if you're giving the browser a lot of work, doing some long running task, uh, animation scrolling, a lot of things are gonna be impacted by uh, those long running JavaScript tasks. So I mentioned before that uh, we need to measure how we're performing. Performance is subjective. Um, this is why we do things like lazy load images or show placeholders uh, while the images are loading. This is why we server side uh, render um, apps that are then client side regenerated. So we can show the user something before whatever the work is that we have to do. So showing the user something is more useful than showing them nothing. Um, so showing them the skeleton of a page where, and then maybe things will pop in later is feels less, um, board time is longer time. So the more you can show the user, the more they can see and do, uh, the less bored they'll feel, the less like they'll feel like the performance is lacking. But because it's subjective, we, we need some, um, concrete ways to measure performance. So we need some techniques for measuring that. So how do we measure performance? It's with web vitals. Uh, web vitals are metrics. They're how we uh, measure performance, how Google measures performance specifically. Uh, we had early metrics like the load event and time to first byte, but because SEO was using these to rank sites, they could be gamed and people found ways to game these metrics and boost their SEO ranking uh, by having fake metrics that didn't correspond with how their site was actually performing. Uh, because Google didn't want to be gamed and they want to have realistic metrics that actually uh, are realistic for how people experience the site. They introduced Core Web Vitals a few years ago. Um, and as of last year, these Web Vitals are impacting your SEO. So if your site is underperforming and Google, Google is downranking you accordingly. So there's two kinds of Web Vitals. There's the Core Web Vitals. These are the kind that Google says you should focus on. There are three of them. Um, Google thinks these are the most indicative of the user experience and that optimizing these will generally cover all your bases. And there's also other web vitals that are more like diagnostic tools to allow you to hone in on performance issues. So the core web vitals are largest contentful paint, LCP, first input delay, FID, and cumulative layout shift. Uh, largest contentful paint, this is the largest section for like the main part of your site that loads within the viewport. So this is probably a hero image, or if you're in the enviable position where you don't have a hero image, you, it might be uh, some web font text of like your um, header, your headline of your hero. Um, this is one of the hardest to optimize, um, poorly performing Google says for a lot of sites. So we'll dive into LCP a little bit deeper later. First input delay is the time from uh, the site loading to is actually interactive for the user. Uh, if you've ever experienced a site where it's loaded, you clicked a button, but the button do, didn't do anything until then maybe JavaScript loaded and then you could interact with it. Uh, that's first input delay. Cumulative layout shift. Layout shift you've experienced if you've gone to a site and you're gonna click a button and then an ad pops in, shifts the button down and you accidentally click the ad, that's a layout shift. Cumulative layout shift is a running total. Um, as things move around on your page, as the user, user interacts with the page, cumulative layout shift will be continually calculated uh, based on those interactions. Other web vitals are first contentful paint. This is like the first meaningful render on the page. It might be like your header nav. Interaction to next paint is the user interacting with the page and something, some content changing on the page, and it's the time for that. Time to interactive. Um, it's similar to first input delay. First input delay is a field metric. So when you run Lighthouse scores, you will not get first input delay. It requires user, user interaction. Time to interactive is similar, but it can be calculated as a lab metric um, just by automation. The browser's the best guess of when the user can actually interact. Total blocking time is, as I mentioned before, resources are by default. Um, blocking, you calculate all that blocking time up and then you get total blocking time. Time to first byte is one of those older metrics where just from the initial get request to the server um, responding with some bytes, that's uh, time to first byte. Um, the last three here have asterisks that's because uh, those are kind of diagnostic metrics. They don't really correlate with something the user actually experiences. They help you like diagnose maybe issues for, of performance where the other ones kind of correlate more to uh, something that user actually experiences. This is a layout of some of the web vitals. We have the start, um, and then we have first contentful paint where we have the nav kind of coming in. The LCP is probably that uh, Superman uh, hero image. Cumulative layout shift is things moving around. Say if this ad here was instead 
instead of a sidebar ad was like a header ad and it maybe shifts all the content down that would affect cumulative layout shift and then first input delay requires some user input so maybe they're clicking on the button that's appearing for first contentful paint but it's not yet interactive because it needs javascript um, and that's impacting first input delay um, multiple items can be your lcp image uh, lcp element if they uh, render within the same render cycle but usually it'll be a single image or single element so how do I get data? Data is important to informing us how we should start tackling performance issues. Um, so we use kind of sciencey terms. We have lab data and we have field data. Lab data is things like Lighthouse, Web Page Test, the Performance tab in DevTools, and the new Performance Insights tab. Field data is things like real user monitoring. This is probably like a SaaS that you have to like stick a script in your page, and it will load uh, some. JavaScript, which will record user interactions and report to maybe a server somewhere and then give you dashboards to evaluate like how your users are experiencing your site. The Chrome user experience report is um, freely available data. Uh, unbeknownst to us, Chrome has for years now been gathering data about the performance of all the sites that we visit when we use Chrome. Uh, this data is for like the top million sites or so. So if your site is within that category, this data is already freely available to you at no performance cost to you. Uh, if your site is not within that, then this is basically useless to you. But there's a lot of value if that applies to you that the Crux data can give you. Uh, this data is biased. It's only Chrome browsers. Um, if you don't know, all browsers on iOS are Safari under the hood. They all run WebKit under the hood. So in this data set, there is no representation of iOS devices. On um, Mac OS, there's a lot of Safari users, so it's underrepresented for both Mac OS and I iOS, well, not represented for iOS. So this data set is biased in that it's only Chrome browsers. Uh, your scores might be a little bit worse for mobile than uh, they are in the real world because it doesn't include iOS devices, which tend to be more um, Android devices tend to be underpowered compared to iOS devices. So the real world experience of users, which includes iOS devices, might be a little bit better than what the crux reports for your mobile scores. Um, and I'll show you a way or in the sources, there's a link that will show you how to create a free Google dashboard using this data and it updates every month. Uh, it's like a month delayed as they're like gathering data, but it's like a permalink that will update with data telling you how your, your site is performing. So lab data is things like Lighthouse. This is in the dev tools. If you don't know, when you run a lab house, a Lighthouse um, report, you need to detach the dev tools from your browser. If it's attached and you only have a sliver of the web page showing, the browser only renders that small sliver of a web page. So your performance will be great because the browser is only rendered 100 pixels tall. So you need to detach it. I would recommend having a separate Chrome profile for performance, which doesn't have any um, extensions. All those extensions run uh, while you're running a Lighthouse audit. All those extensions can read every website you visit and everything you do in the website. They're very uh, super privacy invasive. But so have a performance uh, profile or um, second best would be a, an incognito uh, session, which doesn't have any extensions running and have it detached to run uh, Lighthouse. This gives you a small, uh, like single entry data point for performance on your site. It's relative to your machine running your CPU. You can set some throttling and uh, network and CPU throttling on it to kind of simulate worse devices, but this is relative to your machine. Here we see some more breakdowns of a Lighthouse score. Uh, my favorite use of Lighthouse is to use this a view original trace here. Uh, the performance tab, if you hit record, you have to hit refresh in the browser to reload the page to get that um, on-page load uh, performance audit. But it will include kind of the old stale HTML data in the, the screenshots and in the uh, network waterfall. Uh, and that's kind of confusing. It's like the, the website's there and then it refreshes and then there's blank and then there's more site. So instead of that, I like using this view original trace. You won't have that. You get the blank, um, like clean slate. Uh, so there's the performance tab, which has like many slices here. Each of them have their own scroll bar. Uh, there's a lot of information here. A lot of developers find the performance tab overwhelming. I find it overwhelming. Uh, each of the slices like hijacks the scroll behavior. I find it easy to navigate uh, with the trackpad than a mouse. Uh, you can kind of go left and right and uh, scroll up and down and zoom in. 
uh, the default behavior is to like with the scroll on the mouse is to zoom in. Um, to go up and down, you need to hold shift to scroll up and down. Uh, we have like kind of a CPU uh, memory breakdown at the top. Then we have a network waterfall, then some frames, timings for metrics. And then we have the main thread. And this is like a called a flame chart of the main thread. And it breaks down like the call stacks for each task as they're breaking, as they're happening. Um, one useful tool in this is the uh, kind of pop up at the bottom there. It says um, the bottom up tab. So when you can select a task in that uh, flame chart and it, the corresponding function calls will be shown in the bottom up and bottom up is like sorted by the longest running task. And so you can kind of diagnose if this function that's being called a whole bunch is underperforming. Because so many people find the performance tab overwhelming, uh, Google recently introduced the performance insights tab. Uh, I know it's available in Chrome Canary. I'm not sure if it's yet available in Chrome general. Um, it has a similar kind of view where we have a, a network waterfall here and then the flame chart underneath. Um, all of these have the normal scroll behavior. Um, so just up and down. Um, one interesting aspect to this is the uh, little window there that shows like screenshots. And if you hit that play button, it'll show the page load. You can slow it down. But the screenshots, the little scrubber play bar at the bottom there, and then the timeline uh, blue line all correspond. So you could like scrub through the playback of the load of your site and find in the screenshot when something pops in. And then that little blue bar there will be um, right at where whatever resources are being loaded at the time. And then the right panel here, we have some kind of breakdowns of long JavaScript tasks and some metrics that are being calculated. Uh, then there's web page test. This is kind of a bread and butter for performance. It's similar in ways to the performance tab, gives you network waterfalls, that kind of things, lets you look into network requests, see uh, what's happening. Uh, they have some paid tiers for extra features. I've gotten enormous value from web page test without yet paying them a dime. Uh, here's two network waterfalls from web page test. At the top, we have one there. It's kind of very um, serial. And at the bottom here, we have things happening in parallel. And our goal in performance is to get from the top one to the bottom one, to get from that seven seconds where everything's loaded to three seconds, to get everything squished over to the left. Um, when looking at web page test um, things, one thing to note is the DNS connect SSL, that green, orange, purple bit that's saying there's ne another network request happening. Uh, so your first tip is to, as much as possible for images, JavaScript, that kind of stuff, to either self-host on your own domain or to at least proxy it through your own domain. So the browser doesn't need to make that extra network request to get those resources. Um, if you're proxying it through your domain, like you can still hit a third party CDN, say Cloudinary image CDN. Um, the advantage there is even though you've moved that network request from the client to the server, your server probably has a better network uh, connection to Cloudinary than your client does, the user does. So it's still a better way to uh, not require the client to make those requests. So crux data, as I mentioned before, is the Chrome user experience report data. Uh, here's kind of a dashboard of one of the web metrics. I think it's LCP. And we kind of get a breakdown of the percentiles of users getting a good score versus needs improvement versus this is really bad. Um, you kind of see it is OK, and then it kind of regresses, and then it improves a little bit into August. If you look into the sources, there should be a link to how to make one of these dashboards for Crux data for any site. This uh, data is freely available and open. So you could run, I think there's a maybe a source for a site that has, you can run multiple websites. So you can look at your site versus your competitors, how your Crux data uh, stands up. And then there's RUM. I don't have any examples here. There are numerous RUM solutions. Some offer more features versus others. Uh, if you're looking for performance, I would look for a performance focused RUM solution, something that the script that you have to stick in your site isn't very intensive, is not going to slow your site down, maybe has the option to subsample data. So you're only getting user sessions for 1% of your users. So whatever that performance cost is to run the script is only actually happening to like 1% of your users. RUM data is actually like where the rubber meets the road. So that's kind of the most important, but we'll kind of get into that a little bit. So lab data versus field data. Here's kind of a chart um, on the x-axis. We here we have noise, which is kind of like 
extra information that's like not useful to us. And then signal on the y-axis is like how meaningful that information is. So for lab data at the bottom, things like Lighthouse, this is uh, low noise because you just get one score, how it ran on your computer, but it's not much signal either. It's not super realistic to the experience of users on your site. Then we have synth data, which is close to lab data. This is things like web page test. When you run a web page test, uh, test a server somewhere, uh, you can specify in the advanced settings. Emulating a device is actually going over the network to the uh, web page that you're testing. So that's realistic. The emulate it's an emulating device, but it's still going over the network. It's still making those requests. So it's a little bit more informative, a little bit more signal than just lab data. Field data is like your RUM solution. It's like Crux. There's more noise there. Uh, you'll have bots hitting your website. You'll have users going through several VPNs and through Tor and exiting through a Tor node that isn't a country you don't have any CDNs in. So you'll get like very extreme use cases. So that's noise, uh, but it's more signal. The majority of the data is realistic for the users uh, that are actually using your site and their experience there. So you have to take some interpretation to understand uh, this field data. And to do that, it's presented as percentiles. Um, here we have the median P50, uh, which looks great, but Google actually cares about the P75 percentile. So 75% of your users, are they getting a good score? And so the score for this site is going to be needs improvement. So at P75, uh, not all of those users are having a great score. So you're gonna have a needs improvement for this uh, metric. P95 is going to be the long tail of users, like I mentioned, bots in faraway countries, uh, various edge cases. If you have something that doesn't look like a bell curve here, where um, some users are getting a super fast experience because they're in the same building as your servers versus some people do several VPNs. Um, if it's not like a normal bell curve, then you kind of have some uh, information there that you can diagnose. So if you had a bunch of people having a terrible experience, maybe you ha your website has become popular in a country that you aren't aware of, that you don't like support. And maybe you should, maybe that's an open market that you should look into. Maybe you should have CDNs there. Maybe you should internationalize your site to have the language of that country. You could be getting a lot of users and missing them and they could be having a terrible performance, but for some reason it's really popular there. So if it looks something different from a normal bell curve, that's something to look into. How to go fast. So these are some fast bullet points, the key features to make a site go fast. Do less stuff. Having less to do, the browser's got less to do, it can speed things up, you can have a fast site. Do the less stuff faster. If you can speed it up, sh shrink the resources. Um, if you can serve more resources in parallel with HTTP2 or so, uh, it's gonna be faster. Don't do stuff now when you can do stuff later. The main thread time is very precious and you don't wanna be doing stuff eagerly that isn't even on the screen yet, isn't available for the user to even see. So if you can do stuff later, do stuff later. Do the stuff you have to do in parallel. So we saw those waterfalls before, one was sequential, one was in parallel. So if you do it in parallel, do it in parallel. But this conflicts with kind of the mental model I gave you earlier where everything is blocking. So there's kind of a missing piece here. And that's the preload scanner. So 10 years ago or so, IE introduced the preload scanner, IE innovation. Uh, and this is a scanner that goes through your document, but it's not trying to create DOM. It's not trying to create CSS OM. It's not trying to do any of those things. It's only looking for resources that it can fetch to fetch those eagerly. And your job is to not get in the way of the preload scanner, to make the preload scanner's job as easy as possible. And there are some ways we can give hints to the preload scanner on what the priority of our resources should be. So if we look back at that um, good network waterfall, we can see all of these slow files being loaded in parallel. And that's because they were available in the original HTML that the preload scanner could find them and fetch them in parallel while the main thread is busy doing whatever it's doing. So that was kind of a, a good situation, but likely your network waterfall looks more something like this, where there's some things in parallel and then there's some sequential stuff and then more parallel. Uh, your job is probably gonna be to look at those lines which indicate the web vitals or some metrics and find what's blocking that line and then shift that back. So kind of starting at the right, figuring out what's blocking and then shifting that back, then something else is blocking and shifting that back. 
So for JavaScript, we have some hints now that we can use. And we have the normal script and how to read this is that green line is the main thread. And when it stops, that means the main thread is blocked by some of the resource. So you look at the first one, uh, the main thread's going along, finds this JavaScript, and then has to fetch it and execute it before it can return to whatever it was doing. Uh, with the defer keyword, um, you can see that green thread continues on straight. Even as the JavaScript's being fetched, uh, the main thread is not blocked. So that's running in parallel. Um, at the end there, it will execute. This is when the main thread is idle. That's the benefit of defer. When the main thread is idle, defer will happen and that gets executed. All the JavaScript will get executed on the main thread. So the execution phase is all blocking for all of these. Async, I like to think of as eager defer where you are fetching in parallel with the main thread, but as soon as that download finishes, then you're gonna execute. So this is more for something that you want it to happen pretty quickly, but it doesn't need to block rendering. Then we have type module, which is basically the same as defer, but that little squiggly in the blue there means it can be importing other JavaScript modules. And again, module async is kind of eager defer where you're importing modules, um, but as soon as those finish downloading, the execution is gonna happen. So there's some other keywords, um, pre-connect. This is for the current page. There's pre-connect, preload, prefetch, and it gets confusing. Uh, pre-connect is for the current page. This is going to do things like connect to a separate domain that maybe you have images on or Google fonts or something. You're gonna make that connection in parallel so that you don't have to wait for one resource to finish before the, another connection gets made. So you can kind of move those connections to the left. That's pre-connect. Again, better to self-host or proxy through your domain at least, but in lieu of that, you can pre-connect. Preload, again, this is for current page. This is for resources, where the other one was for domains. This is things like script, images, documents. Uh, you can preload them. Uh, this is a, it raises the priority of this resource on the page. So if you know a, an item like an image is important, but you know it's kind of far down the page and the preload scanner is not gonna find it for a while, you can preload it in the head uh, so that that's being fetched early on. So by the time the, HTP, uh, the HTML parser gets to it, the image is already loaded or already fetched. Prefetch, this is for the next page. This is for a subsequent navigation. This is where you estimate that the user is going to navigate to a page or use something and you want to fetch those resources proactively. Uh, there's rel prefetch, there's things like resources. Um, there's also DNS prefetch. This is just that DNS connection. Um, it's like a subsection of um, pre-connect. So just the DNS section of the like fonts. But this is like the pre-connect for the next page. Fetch priority. So there's fetch priority now. Um, you can put this on resources. This raises or lowers the priority of that resource for the preload scanner. So if you have an LCP image, you can set the fetch priority to high and the, the preload scanner will know this item is optim is should be prioritized. Um, if you have, you might have an LCP image and the HTML parser where the preload scanner will see that image and it will initially prioritize it as low. Um, eventually the browser will determine that actually this image is in the viewport right now and it needs to be raised in priority. And in the dev tools, in the network tab, in the performance tab, you can have a priority pane and you'll see it as the end priority, which would be high. Um, but there was a time when it was low priority. Having this fetch priority there makes it so that initially the priority is high. You can also set it for things like JavaScript, uh, link preloads, iframes, you can set it in JavaScript. Yeah, so at the third line here, we have a link preload for an LCP image with a fetch priority high. So this is kind of like double priority. We are saying that there's an image down in the page, you'll find it eventually, uh, HTML scanner, but we think it should be fetched now and we think it should be fetched as the highest priority. So, the head of your document is the single biggest render blocking part of your page. We don't usually think about that because it's usually like metadata and stuff that's not the render content, but the head is the most render blocking part of your page. There's a great talk by Harry Roberts called Get Your Head Straight on YouTube. It's in the sources at the end of these slides. 
Um, he recommends this order for your page. The kind of grayed out section, each of those grayed out sections can be swapped around. They're not super important, but he thinks this is the optimum order for your site. At the top there, meta char set, HTTP equiv, uh, viewport. These are the things that like set so your site doesn't look like a zoomed out desktop experience on mobile, things like that. Not for your other OG image meta tags, those go in the bottom. Then title, pre-connect, sync, async. Um, and then this middle section is a little um, unintuitive, but uh, he goes into it in deep in the talk and I won't give it justice by trying to explain that, but he says this is the best order for those. Then preload, uh, script defer, prefetch, prerun, everything else. And then after that, all that stuff that marketing tells you needs to be put in the heading. So Google says that LCP is the metric that users are developers are struggling with the most. And thinking about LCP, it's important to consider the percentiles of your users. If you make a change that only impacts the worst case scenarios, that 75th percentile might not move. So if you add a CD in, in a country that is underperforming, it might not actually move your LCP score. Likewise, if you pr improve performance for the users that are already getting good performance, that percentile might not move. So the key here is to make performance improvements that affect everybody. And that way you can move that percentile up. So here we have a kind of example network waterfall. This is from um, optimizing deep dive into optimizing LCP. It's on the Google Chrome developers, YouTube, I think it's in the uh, sources. So here's kind of a example network waterfall. And we have broken into these uh, four sections. We have time to first byte, resource load delay, resource load time, and element render delay. And the spoiler solution that they give is the resource load delay and your element render delay should be ideally like close to nothing. It should be the minimum amount of time. Most of the time should be time to first byte and resource load time. I think you have 2.5 seconds to render your LCP image. Otherwise, Google says it's not great. So here we have the, in the blue, the HTML document, the kind of light colored is like the network timing. And then the blue part is the like actual browser downloading and uh, executing it. And then we have some, uh, some style sheets and CSS. And then we have the green, the image, that's the actual LCP element. And the orange is JavaScript. And we see that the LCP is actually occurring at the very end here after this JavaScript, not after the image is loaded. So, one of the advice you often get for LCP is to optimize your images, make your images smaller and they'll be less intensive and your LCP should improve. But we can see here that improving the LCP image size, um, lowering the quality or sending in a better format, which takes less bytes, um, didn't actually change the LCP time. Um, the LCP time is still being pushed back by this JavaScript. So instead of doing that, um, how to actually improve this is to one way is to um, we could by analyzing this uh, network waterfall, we can kind of see maybe this image is being loaded by the JavaScript, maybe JavaScript's running the client and the JavaScript says fetch this image. If we can instead of server server side render that and have that image initially in the HTML, it will get shifted to the left and the pre preload scanner can find it. When it's in the JavaScript, the preload scanner will not find it. Um, if it's in the initially served HTML, the preload scanner can find that element. So we've shifted that to the left and we basically eliminated the resource load delay time. Um, but the LCP uh, score still haven't, hasn't changed. It's still stuck on that JavaScript. If we can reduce that JavaScript somehow by removing a client side dependency we didn't need or not loading all of Lodash or something, we can finally see that LCP time has moved up, but it's still being blocked on that JavaScript. Uh, maybe this is being rendered client side. Uh, maybe this um, hydration step isn't being deferred till the main thread is idle. Um, if we can find a way to do that with defer, then finally that LCP gets decoupled from the JavaScript. That JavaScript will execute sometime later in the main thread, not blocking this LCP resource. So now finally, the image is the blocking element. And then finally, reducing that image size will impact the LCP. So say we've done that, maybe we have a new blocking element. So now CSS is blocking the LCP time. The largest uh, blocking element is CSS. 
So maybe we can find a way to reduce the CSS. Maybe there was some that was unused we can take out of there. Uh, maybe we can break it into more multiple style sheets that can be loaded in parallel, taking your um, media queries out into their own mobile uh, style sheet that gets a rel media um, query attribute. The browser will um, prioritize that only if the viewport meets that media query. It's a good way to do that. Um, we can shrink that CSS size. And then again, the image itself is the render blocking uh, element. And so we've moved that LCP all the way from the right to the left. So some quick bullet points, things to improve performance. Again, these should be um, determined by data. You should look at your data and determine, will this problem I'm seeing in the data be resolved by these uh, solutions? So one is to use HTTP2 and HTTP3. These can serve multiple resources in parallel. Um, I'm not an ops person. I don't know how to set that up for you on the server, uh, but you can figure that out. Uh, cache assets. So your assets should have hashes and cache headers to tell the browser how long to keep them. Um, the more you can break bundles down into smaller bundles that you can cache separately, the less you'll need to invalidate those caches, the longer they can stay in your user's browser and provide uh, performance improvements by not being needed to load over the network. Don't block BF cache. BF cache is something the browser can do under certain circumstances where it will save um, all the resources and the JavaScript and the JavaScript heap um, in memory cache. So when you hit the back and forward buttons on your browser, it's like an instantaneous um, site. The browser just loads up the state of that JavaScript at the time you navigate it away from that page. There are certain things like the unload event or the before unload event. I think that's only for Firefox um, or using window.open. Um, these things will make it so the browser can't use BF cache. So look that, I think they show up in Lighthouse audits, um, but make sure you're not doing this. Make sure your third parties that you're using aren't doing this and you'll have BF and ca ca BF cache enabled for your site. Self-host or proxy, or at least pre-connect. Um, SSR responsive images, especially LCP. On the project I'm currently working on, we had some issues. We were using Cloudinary, which as kind of best practice, but we were using the client side Cloudinary bundle to load images with JavaScript. And there was a bug in the Cloudinary bundle where a giant massive desktop image was getting loaded for all users, including mobile, before then being re-requested at a reasonable size. The browser was downloading these images and throwing them away. Uh, I think Cloudinary shipped a fix to this bug, uh, but the solution that I came up with was to server-side render these images, these LCP images, using responsive images with multiple source sets, um, had multiple um, art directions. So for desktop, it would be one image and then a slightly cropped different image for mobile, but having different source sets and having that in the initial HTML means the browser can determine which of those sources fits the viewport optimize for that source and it will load the, the others like as the main thread is idle uh, just in case the browser you, you you move the browser and resize it and needs those images but having those especially the lcp image in the initial html is crucial um, use fewer fonts or variable fonts this is a new font format that allows you to have multiple italics bolds and all that in a single uh, font source don't preload stuff that's not initially available. A lot of people will preload all their fonts because they heard it was good and will help you with um, performance. But if those fonts aren't initially available in the viewport, if the user isn't seeing them, they don't need to be preloaded, eagerly loaded. Eagerly loaded. Again, these are um, performance optimizations that need to be uh, made with informed data. Uh, have a preference for loading equals lazy. All the browsers support it now. It used to not be supported in Safari, but it is now. Um, there's lots of JavaScript solutions for lazy loading images. Um, they come at a cost running that JavaScript. Uh, loading lazy, will the browser will um, do the work for those images like when they become near the viewport. Uh, you might, depending on your app, depending on how fast the user scrolls, might see some image pop in. Um, the browsers will continue to improve on this, um, getting better heuristics for when an image needs to be loaded. Um, if it doesn't work for you, then maybe go back to a JavaScript solution, but prefer, prefer lazy loading um, over JavaScript solutions. 
CodeSplit, JS, and CSS. So I mentioned before the preload scanner, but now browsers actually can use multiple worker threads to run uh, multiple requests in parallel. Uh, so the more smaller bundles you can send, the better the browser can optimize loading those bundles. Um, a larger bundle takes a longer time to load, parse, execute. So having those split up more granularly will help you. Safe space for lazy loaded objects. This is for cumulative layout shift. Um, at a previous project I worked on, we had um, sometimes uh, ad banners, but sometimes those ads would be a footer or a sidebar. There was kind of an ad um, auction process, and we didn't actually know where those ads would end up as the page rendered. So we couldn't save space in the header for the image, so it pushed the content down. Uh, so that was kind of a trade-off we had to make. Um, but if you know that something's going to be coming in later, lazily, pop in later, save space for it so you don't get cumulative layout shift uh, deductions. Look into offloading third-party scripts. There is a new tool for, called Party Town by Builder Builder.io. Um, this is a service worker and also uses a web worker. And basically, you can offload third-party scripts, Google Tag Manager, analytic stuff to this third-party script. Most of those scripts assume they're running on the main thread. They assume they have access to document, to window, to all these things um, where they would not have access to that in a service worker. But the magic of Party Town is they found a way to um, send messages between the main thread and between the service worker so that those scripts can still get the data, the information that they need in an async manner where they think it's synchronous. And so those scripts will not block the main thread. They won't take up that main thread time. They'll be running the service worker and the web worker, um, and they won't block the main thread. Um, this will take some experimentation to see if it actually works. There is some edge cases, um, but it's something to look into. So hot takes. These are mostly my opinions, and I'll give some justification for them, but they are my opinions. Uh, don't use Critical CSS. Critical CSS, if you don't know, is a technique where you inline just the CSS in a style tag in the HTML for the viewport on the page. So this is saving a network request that uh, data is um, available quicker for the HTML parser. Um, I've never seen this work in production anywhere. I've attempted it multiple times and I've never seen it to be a benefit. Your CSS is often not your biggest blocking performance issue. Um, CSS, critical CSS is not cacheable since it's inlined. Uh, it's not cacheable. So to make it cacheable, you either have to duplicate that CSS in the larger CSS bundle that's coming later uh, so that at subsequent navigations that cache is available and you don't need to, or you need to in line that CSS again for subsequent navigations. Uh, so that's not optimal. Um, another thing is that the viewport that you're assuming that you're um, inlining the CSS for, you have to guess for the user's viewport. You don't know when you're initially serving that HTML. So are you going to support users that have a ultra wide screen, but oriented uh, vertically? <laughs> might be all of your CSS. So it's basically a guess and you might have a user that has a viewport you don't estimate and maybe your CSS cutoff was above that. Organizing code for critical CSS is non-trivial. Um, maintaining that is non-trivial. Um, CSS is not likely to be your bottle script, bottleneck. Um, so I don't recommend this technique. Um, if you implement critical CSS and then later the marketing team says, we need this analytics script in there. And then suddenly that analytics script is your single biggest uh, performance bottleneck. All that effort you did for critical CSS is gone. Uh, it's no longer your blocking performance thing. And you basically inferring the cost of non-cacheable CSS, uh, having to duplicate it um, with none of the benefits of the fast performance because it's no longer your biggest block bottleneck. Uh, so I've never seen critical CSS work. If your deploy platform has like a plugin or something that s says it's going to automatically do this for you, by all means, test it out, see if it works. But I would not count on critical CSS to save you from performance issues. Don't use React. So prefer, Re prefer Preact. Uh, Preact is much smaller than React. 
Um, it's virtual DOM diffing uh, is much faster. Uh, basically, the API is one to one. There's edge cases that you might need to figure out and work out. But the sooner that you can move to Preact, the sooner you will have fewer uh, performance issues. Uh, you can run Preact in Next.js. Um, most scenarios where you're running React, you basically shouldn't be. <laughs> Prefer Preact. Um, that's it. Don't use CSS and JS. So if you're not familiar, CSS and JS is a solution to a problem that only exists in the React ecosystem. This problem doesn't exist in Vue ecosystem. This problem doesn't exist in the Svelte ecosystem. Um, because React did not provide um, its own co-located scoped style solution, uh, CSS and JS came in to fill this void. The difference uh, is even though in Vue and Svelte, the, those CSS solutions are technically CSS and JavaScript, they get bundled down into real CSS that's served to the user. Uh, and they don't let you depend on certain things that require runtime JavaScript. So CSS and JS might look like this. Um, I think this example looks terrible. It's not very cherry picked. It came from like the third page of the documents. Um, most CSS and uh, JS solutions require runtime JavaScript. Uh, for all of these props that are being inserted, um, they are props from the component being stuck into the uh, CSS, require an event handler, they require um, insert rule JavaScript calls. Um, this amount of JavaScript grows as your CSS grows. So not only do you have CSS growing, you have JavaScript growing as you write more styles. Um, there are solutions for in CSS for JF, JS. If you like this um, API for whatever reason, um, look for libraries that have no runtime cost. They likely compile to um, custom properties or otherwise known as CSS variables. Um, these are declarative reactive variables in CSS now. They're widely supported. Um, most of the dynamicism that CSS and JS uh, says you can get can be done with custom properties in vanilla CSS or in these libraries that have no runtime cost. There is like a small number of edge cases where um, runtime CSS and JS has abilities that other uh, no runtime libraries don't have, like setting the n in the nth selector um, with JavaScript. Um, you can't set um, custom properties in the selector for CSS. So certain cases like that, um, those no runtime libraries won't handle. Um, I don't think you should be setting that <laughs> anyways. Um, something to consider. Uh, CSS and JS is a large performance um, detriment. Don't use Tailwind. So I have a lot of personal reasons why I don't like Tailwind. Uh, the main performance uh, issue is that you only get a single CSS bundle. If you have a highly interactive app that is loading a whole bunch of JavaScript anyways and CSS is not your blocking element, this might not be a concern for you. You might be fine with Tailwind. Um, but because you only get a single uh, CSS bundle, it's more likely that CSS could become your single biggest uh, performance bottleneck. Um, like I mentioned before, there's web workers. The smaller the bundles you can make, um, the better they can optimize for. With Tailwind, you can't break that CSS down into by route, by component, by viewport. So basically all the styles possibly ever used on your app have to be downloaded by the user on the initial page visit. And like initial impressions, first impressions are important. Um, like an especially egregious example of this would be if you're sharing a repo between your app, which uses a lot of styles and maybe some marketing pages, which are mostly static, um, don't use a lot of styles. If you're sharing that repo and you're sharing a single uh, Tailwind bundle, then the visitors of your marketing page are having to download all of the CSS for your app, all of the viewports, all of that for those static pages. So basically, don't do that. <laughs> um, if you're concerned and you think you need to optimize smaller bundles for CSS, um, Tailwind will kind of restrict you in ways that um, other techniques will not. Read your build files. So this is a good technique that I've learned. Um, the output 
I don't mean just mean your source code. I mean like what your framework generates, what is being sent to the user, the actual um, obfuscated, minified HTML. Read that, <laughs> read the JavaScript bundles. You will see stuff that should not be there. You will see stuff like an SVG being inline for an icon, but it's used a thousand times on the website. So it's blowing up the HTML by like three times. You will see stuff like data encoded images being inline multiple times. Um, again, inline things are not cacheable. So um, for SVG, stick it in a, a sprite sheet that can be cached and referenced. Um, data encoded images are a great way to save a network request. Uh, but if you're doing it multiple, multiple, multiple times, you're just blowing up your HTML bundle. The browsers have to do the same work over and over again. Uh, you'll see things like JSON blobs for maybe internationalization, like um, language translations being sent to the client when maybe you only thought they were being used on the server and they're being rendered to the server. Maybe that JSON blob for all those translations is being sent on the client for every user, for every location, whether or not they're using those languages. Um, your framework probably manages a lot of this for you, but it is incumbent upon you to understand what your framework is generating, how it's being sent to the client, how the client is loading it. So reading your build files is a good way to understand that. Don't ship code that looks like this. Hydration is bad. Hydration is a workaround. Uh, we had single page applications, which were, you basically have a shell of HTML shipped to the client that loads some JavaScript and then that JavaScript builds up the page on the client. So you had slow initial load times, but then afterwards you only had to fetch some data and then did some transitions. But to fix that slow initial load time, we added server-side rendering to that. So we would run that same app on the server to generate that HTML. But then we would have to send that HTML over the wire to the client. And when all that state in JavaScript that we built up, we would lose it. So even though the client had that HTML, it didn't have any of that JavaScript state. It didn't know where event handler should go. So we'd have to run that JavaScript again on the client to build up that state. And this is called hydration. And so you get initially get an HTML element, HTML document that looks great, but you can't click on anything until that JavaScript loads. And then you can finally interact with the page. It's called hydration and the hydration times are just getting longer and longer and longer and longer. And this is impacting first input delay for many, many sites. There's a lot of frameworks, a lot of libraries tackling this technique. Um, Astro is like a meta framework. You can use any Vue, Svelte, um, SolidJS, React, um, any uh, Vue library in it. Um, but it does server-side rendering. It does um, islands, also the, um, fresh. Islands are basically like small snippets of hydration that happen. And you can have them lazily loaded. So um, only when they scroll into the viewport will that hydration step happen. So you don't have this long hydration task. Um, Sold Start is also doing some of that. I don't actually know what SvelteKit is doing. Great things, I think, but I haven't looked into it too much. Um, Quick is doing something they call resumability, where they build that state up on the server, and then they embed that state as HTML attributes in the HTML that gets sent over the wire. So on the client, all that state doesn't need to be built up again. It's like embedded in the HTML. Um, they'll then fetch small, tiny JavaScript bundles for interactivity as needed. And they have like a service worker to prefetch that so you don't have that network request um, for user interaction. Um, <clears throat> Remix is um, like a in-between framework, uses React, um, but kind of manages between the back end and the front end. Uh, they encourage using like forms to mutate data. So basically, you don't need client-side state with Remix. Um, a lot of the issues that the React team is like trying to tackle with suspense, with um, the new RFC for use and server components, basically none of that is necessary in React or in Remix. Remix with React. Um, you basically get an HTML document and by encouraging forms, those are um, interactive by default, even before JavaScript loads. Um, they're then progressively enhanced by the hydration um, in JavaScript. And with Remix, you can have code that just runs on the server. So you can do a lot of JavaScript stuff on the server and not have to ship those resources, uh, those dependencies or that logic to the client. Solid Start is also doing a lot of things like Astro with 
um, islands. Uh, they're also doing some taking a lot of inspiration from Remix. A lot of these are in beta or at least very new. Um, yet to see like how they pan out, what the industry chooses as um, good frameworks for production, large applications. Um, but basically the industry is no longer um, accepting long hydration times. Uh, so these are my sources. Uh, they're not in like APA format or anything like that because I don't know how to do that. Um, but thank you.